Hello and thank you for tuning in. We are the final whistle and today we are joined by Neil Miller. Neil, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Right, so today's video is just going over Neil's career, obviously playing for Liverpool, Preston, West Ham, Sheffield Wednesday. So Neil, we'll start off by speaking about your dad. Um, obviously big footsteps to follow in. Um, yeah. How did that set you up to become a professional footballer? Well, if you go on uglyfootballers.com, you'll see my dad. Because when he played, he had a big long mullet. Um, and he started at Man City that's where he, he began his career City nowadays are a top side but they've been a pretty average side for a long time my dad was part of a really good Man City side late 60s early 70s and um, they were challenging for the league back then he was a left winger he was tall he was skinny he was quick I wasn't quick I wasn't skinny I wasn't particularly tall but he was a professional football player and for me as a young boy I wanted to follow in his footsteps because he'd been a football player. Uh, that was the, uh, the the dream back then, um, and I, I was fortunate enough to um, to follow in his footsteps. So what, by the time I was playing, he was completely bald, and nobody recognised who he was. But yeah, he was a player, and, and that was where my desire and my dream really started. So you started your career at grassroots level. Yeah. Um, so that was in Manchester. In, yeah, in Sale. So Sale's quite famous for a rugby team these days. So that, I was playing two years above myself. That was where I st how I started. It was a team called Priory. And I scored top scorer every season, whatever, 30, 40, 50 goals. And then I got to the age of 10, playing under 12s, and the league stopped me playing because they said I was too young. So rather than being too old, they said that physically it wasn't fair on me. But I was scoring top scorer every... I was like, well, I'm scoring every game, so why are you stopping me playing? So I was quite upset about that. And so I left the grassroots at the age of 10. And that was when I joined a professional club, which which back then was, was Man City. That was how it all started for me. And then you were at Manchester City's academy then. Yeah. Uh, and you made the move over to Liverpool. Uh, age Smart move, yeah. <laughs> uh, age 16. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's players such as Jamie Carragher, Steven Gerrard, Trent Alexander-Arnold, who we've seen now, yeah. who all progressed through the Pools Academy. Yeah. Did you feel, looking at players obviously before Gerrard, that you could go on to do the same and achieve the great things for the pool? Wanted to. I knew how hard it was going to be because there's been thousands of players that have had that same dream. So when I arrived at 16, I was thinking, oh my God, I've got to get from under 18s to the reserves to the first team so there's like steps to get there and the big difference was we were at, in Kirby which is the academy building we were nowhere near the first team so I never got to see Cara I never got to see Stevie Fowler Owen some of these top players I never got to see them until I got to the reserve so I knew I had to do well at the youth team before I could get an opportunity to be anywhere near the first team um, but I knew it was the first step of, of being a professional player 65 quid a week if you want to know how much I was on it, it wasn't big money but it was the first time I was paid to, to play and um, and it meant a lot back then you know it was um, training every day all of a sudden doing weights for the first time I'd never done weights before things like that um, but it was the start of that journey to hopefully get to, to Melwood where the first team boys were and try and get in the first team but I never thought I'm going to emulate Stevie G it was about me I wanted to be a professional football player for me and play in the first team for Liverpool However, we say about the, the players who have progressed through the academy, however, there's 30% of academy players who actually make it into first teams. And do you think some academies with such a low percentage rate who make it give, especially at such a young age, a false sense of hope uh, for aspiring footballers? Yeah, I think that's quite a high number. If that, if that figure's right, that's huge, 30% actually make it. Um, yeah, what I would say is the most important thing is for kids to get their education, to do that. Yes, to dream and be a professional football player, but not to forget that because you're only in the game a short time. When I signed for Liverpool, Steve Highway was the academy manager and he said to me, I'm preparing you for the day you leave this football club. I just signed a contract for Liverpool and he's telling me I'm going to leave the football club. So, so it happens to everyone, whether you're the best, whether you're the worst, you will leave that football club at some point. So in your head, you've got to appreciate the time you have at Liverpool, but you will leave that football club. So the, the stats about academy players making it, that's the dream, that's the ultimate, but you've got to keep doing the education and see the footballers. This is a bit the enjoyment bit to, to try and make it and, and have a career in the game, but it's very difficult for those young players. 
sacrifice is a, is a word a lot of people use you've got to make sacrifices it's more of an investment for yourself how can you get better how can you be the best that you can be rather than going out with your mates and drinking and girls because at 16, 17, 18 we know what it's like that's what it's like at those ages it's a case of doing the right things to help you for your career and, and get the best out of yourself uh, a bit about Steve Highway obviously you speak about him very often um, how, how much of a how much did he law you in possibly to Liverpool Football Club? Obviously leaving City, the, the team that you supported from a kid. How, how hard was that decision? Uh, it wasn't hard because Liverpool were, were a Premier League team and, and City were a League Two team, third division. Um, I wanted to be a professional football player and Steve Highway was a great player in his time and he said, you're raw, but we'll give you an opportunity to try and improve and, and have a career in the game. So I listened to him. You know, that was the important thing. He said to me, support this football club so you understand what the people are about what the city is about so that that will give you a chance to make it at this club and he said even if you don't make it at Liverpool whatever club you go to really commit yourself to that club because that will give you a better chance and so I was 16 coming to Liverpool I moved to Liverpool I got to understand what the people were about the, the fans going to the stadium I was at the, the games thinking what it was like to represent Liverpool rather than just going back to my family who still, still lived in Sale at the time and uh, really committed to Liverpool and loved it. So since the age of 16, I've never moved out of the area because I've loved the people, the city, the football club so much. And I'm grateful for Stevie Highway giving me that chance. And obviously you could have, when you signed for Liverpool, gone back home to sail every day. Yeah. And I believe you lived quite close to Anfield when you first signed. Yeah, yeah. out of my bedroom window was the, was the away end. I was on, I was on the Annie Road end, which... Now it's been redeveloped, the house has been knocked down. It was a 10 bedroom house, I was living in it. There was a Welsh lad in there, five or six Irish boys. It was carnage, it was absolutely <laughs> carnage every day. But we had a family next door that would cook for us, clean for us, um, and so all we had to do was obviously go to training and, and, and do that. It was um, good time, yeah, but outside the bedroom window was, was the Anfield Road. So there's a proper buzz about match day. So I'm talking about that connection, about being around the ground, and you felt it on match day, certainly. So, moving on to now your Liverpool debut, um, do, you want, do you want to take us through that against Ipswich? Well, I arrived at Anfield in a Renault Clio. What Liverpool first team is, is going to turn up in a Renault Clio for starters? <laughs> They've all got mink cars. Um, playing against Ipswich, from a family with their mum, dad, brother, sisters all there. And um, Julio was the manager, and he told me that I was playing the day before, so I was absolutely buzzing. Stevie Gerrard was playing, Marcus Babel was playing, Abel Xavier, remember Abel Xavier? He was playing, played for Everton as well. Uh, Caro was playing. So I, I was playing up front, I think Juve was playing alongside me. And just before the game started, Julio, the manager, said, who wants to take pens? Now, it was a bit of a change team from the first team, so the regular penalty taker wasn't starting. So I said, yeah, just thinking, I'll try my luck. And Julio looked at me and went, bang, you're on pens. So I was thinking... The last pen I took was in the Youth Cup semi and I missed it, so, so I wasn't very good at penalties anyway. Uh, but, but I was taking a pen, so it gave me a bit of a lift before the game. First half I was awful, should have, should have been dragged off, I was that bad. And then second half started to improve a little bit, won a penalty at the cop end, went to get the ball and El Hadj Juf had got the ball. Now Jufi, as we know, isn't the most liked player at <laughs> Liverpool, but he never spoke English. It took him three years before he learned how to say hello or anything like that and he was on the penalty spot in front of the cop with the ball under his arm and I'm thinking give me the ball and he's like looking at me as if to say because he doesn't understand me yeah. um, and the cop are looking at me going what's a young kid arguing with the first team player for they didn't know that Julio told me I was on pens so I turned to the skipper Stevie G and I said tell him I'm on pens the problem was we were losing 1-0 to Ipswich you know had it been 0-0 Stevie might have gone to Juve give him the pen now but we were losing 1-0 Juve took the pen I'm hoping the keeper saves it or it's the post so I can put the rebound in. He scored it, we drew 1-1. Two minutes later, I've hit the post, um, so I could have scored. So I could have scored the penalty, could have scored my, my chance when I hit the post. I didn't, but we went through in that game. We ended up winning the League Cup and I scored in the semi-final. So I've got a League Cup winner's medal from that year, but I never scored on my debut because of Jufi. He'll never get in my greatest 11. Yeah, no, that, that, could have, that definitely could have been the hero debut. It though. could have been, it could have been what might have been. But um, obviously we go back to the, the FA Youth Cup, as you said, which was 2000-2001 season where yeah. Liverpool did so well and got to the semi-final. 
you were the top scorer at the time, eight goals in four games, I believe, and then. Oh, you got to do your stats, get your stats right. Nine goals. Nine goals in four games. Check your stats. Come on, nine goals I got. Um, and then you you played so many games that season for for the youth team and also for the reserves as well. Um, do you feel like in that season you should have got more opportunities with the first team, especially after scoring so many in the youth cup? Not really. It was different back then because the first team was so separate to the academy. It, it was a, it, we never really seen them. So the, my only chance was scoring for the youth team to then get in the reserves. That was the the next step for me. But when I was in the reserves, I was playing with Gary McAllister. I was playing with Jamie Redknapp. I was playing with Marcus Babble, Stefan Ensho. Um, it, it was like ten internationals played. It was mad. The reserve football was was that good then. I was buzzing to play in the reserves. So when I scored all those goals in the youth cup. It gave me a bit of a lift to think, yeah, I can, I, I can do it, and so um, that helped me get noticed more by the first team players and the staff. So every game, seventeens, nineteens, the first team players would say, "How many did Mello score?" So that that was the sort of running thing from the first team. So that's how I got my chance down there. But yeah, nine goals in the youth cup. We beat <laughs> we beat Chelsea at Stamford Bridge seven one. That was a, that was the best result along the way. I missed a penalty in the semi, so I should have scored. Moving on to your first Liverpool goal against. Sheffield United tell us a bit about the goal great goal absolutely great it was no it was um, free kick Smicer whipped it in from the right wing Sammy Ippy got a flick on and I've headed it from six yards it was not the greatest goal but I was absolutely buzzing because it was in front of the travelling cop the away fans were there semi-final of a league cup um, it was a bit a special moment for me obviously Liverpool went in front in that game the bad thing about that was in the interviews afterwards I didn't think I was going to be starting the game, so I forgot my wash bag. So I was doing my first ever interview on ITV Sport, and I needed a haircut. I had no hair gel. I looked honestly looked a right idiot. And so, um, yeah, thankfully they didn't have social media then, otherwise it would have been viral. <laughs> the state of my hair back then. But I got the goal, done an interview, and, and that was a special moment to score. Yeah. So that time at the club must have been slightly weird because obviously there was an interim manager. Um, around that time with Julia obviously out due to his medical condition so was that a, a weird time to be around the club? Never experienced it because I was at the academy so the difference between the academy and the first team was t two different sites so I was not at that level of the first team to be training every day with them while Gerard was, was struggling with his illness so Phil Thompson took over and when we were playing reserve football, we just saw, saw Sammy Lee or Phil Thompson. So we, ne we never got to see Julier before the season after was when I stepped up to Melwood and be around the first team. But thankfully, Julier recovered and he was OK because he gave me my debut. Uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. But I, I never got to sort of see what was going on at the first team at that time because I was at the academy. And then League Cup, as you mentioned before, uh, in 2002-03. Um, what was that cup run like? Obviously, the Liverpool won the cup that year. Um, was it positive atmosphere at the time? Yeah, yeah, because I was buzzing because I was getting games in the League Cup. So scored, uh, played against Ipswich, might have been the fourth round, and then I never played again till the semi when I scored the goal against Sheffield. Um, but the final was against Man United, which is obviously a dream final for Liverpool to beat Man United in a final. It was at Cardiff, but back then there was only five subs. So the manager put the sheet up on the day before at Melwood, 17 players, only 16 get changed. And I was thinking, I've got a chance here. I think it was like Juve and Shea Ruhr. I'm thinking, I'm better than them. I'm going to be on the bench here. And then he turned around to me. We travelled down to Cardiff. We go walking around the pitch the day before, get, you know, getting to see it all. And he just said, you're not going to be on the bench, but I want you to experience this, this cup final. Um, and... He said, if anyone gets ill tonight, you're on the bench. And I looked at him, looked at him as if to say, who's going to get ill the night before a cup fan against Man United? That, no one's going to tell you if they are ill. But anyway, but I was on the bench, but not changed. So I experienced all the team talks, everything like that, and, and the celebrations afterwards, which was amazing uh, to beat United. It's a bit of a forgotten cup final because we've had quite a few successful cup finals since. That was a big cup final. Stevie scored. Owen scored, Man United, they were a really good side back then um, and that was my first Cardiff experience with the first team. I'd done it with the youth team 2001 when we won the treble uh, but that was in the dressing room with the first team which was amazing. Shall I've still got a bottle of champers with, with Carlin Cup winners 2003 at home, there you go. So then you then went to West Ham on loan? West Ham. Um, 
which was cut short due to injury, I believe. Can you tell us a bit about the learning move? Cut short because of injury and because I was awful. Um, <laughs> yeah, I had the choice out of Sunderland or West Ham, and I chose West Ham. I thought I had more chance of doing well there. Went down there, Glen Road was the manager, and he said he'd develop me as a player, so I was like, okay, I'll, I'll have a bit of that. Three games in, he'd been sacked, so I was like, I'm there for the season, so I was devastated. So Trevor Brookin took over, and he was brilliant, played me all the time, played me, Defoe, and David Connolly as a front three, so I was involved playing all the games. But he said he d didn't want the job, so I knew somebody was going to be coming in, I didn't know who. Ended up being Alan Pardew, and Pards was honest, he said, listen, you're not my player. I want my own players so I was like okay I'm here for the season I want to play I'll try and get in your plans he was like fine never started the game for parts at all but that, that was the way it was you know never held anything against him for that and I'd had enough I was playing reserves for West Ham I was like on the bench occasionally not even all the time I was like I'll go back to Liverpool I can train with the first team I can play reserve team football there what's the point of being at West Ham so I cut it short in the March I went back to Liverpool it wasn't injury it was the fact I was, I was not wanted at West Ham because the manager didn't want me um, and, and that was how that ended so I actually played four reserve games for Liverpool at the end of that season scored 10 goals so, so I, was, I was fully fit Julio was still in charge but I wasn't allowed to be involved with the first team because of my loan conditions that, that was the rules So then we then go on to the Arsenal game which yeah. obviously is some of the Liverpool fans fondest memories of you um, the goal obviously to beat Arsenal 2-1 at the cop end yeah. speakers through the strike yeah some people have said it's just a fluke but um, <laughs> it was uh, it was one of those moments that I'd always wanted you know as a young player to score the winning goal you know it was last minute best team around which Arsenal were front of the cop you know I shared the moment with the fans which was amazing and so even 10 years 15 years how about 20 years people still remember that moment so it's nice to hear where fans were whether they're in the cop whether they were in a different part of Liverpool or a booze or somewhere different part of the world it's nice to have a moment that they remember um, I was more surprised that the manager hadn't brought me off I was thinking he's surely gonna bring me off but he kept me on and uh, and so it was it was meant to be that sort of moment it was a decent strike um, I was shattered I wasn't doing anything else but hitting the ball and Lehman had no chance in the back of the net so that was a, a great match I think the best part was because people often say how did it feel I just wanted to stay there with the fans and I honestly just just absolutely milk it as much as possible it was, it was amazing and then less than or just over a week later uh, Champions League um, and Liverpool have then got to score three uh, to, to progress in the Champions League against yeah. Olympiacos I make it 2-1 Stevie gets the third 3-1 so how, how that happened was Olympiacos were the top of the group and because they'd beaten us 1-0 at their place match day 6 1-0 down we're thinking we've got to score 3 second half because yeah. Rivaldo had scored a free kick first half at the cop end and I remember Cara saying we can do this um, and I was fuming because I was on the bench and Rafa never brought me on he brought Cinema Pongol on and I was thinking I score more goals than him why are you bringing him on but he brought him on Pongol scored like two minutes into the second half 1-1 one, one. And, I'm, and I'm thinking what a genius <laughs> Rafa is yeah bringing him on and so I was sat there thinking will he get me on because we need a goal he brought me on I scored and then 10 minutes to go that was when Stevie scored one of his, his best goals it was amazing and then you've you've done that header and it's obviously so famous the commentary as well yeah. which is which has made it so good and people <laughs> yeah. are playing now in the streets and, and they say that that line of the commentary yeah. And the lovely cushioned header is you, but it's not always said as lovely cushioned header by Mella. Yeah, uh, it doesn't need to be, it's fine, <laughs> it's fine. So the, the biggest thing for me was that Stevie still acknowledges that that I played a part for him to score that goal. So, so he's scored so many great goals, he's been an unbelievable captain for the football club. But he still sort of says, listen, I couldn't have had that moment without you, which is nice. But at the time, I had Stevie and they had John Arnery, so they were my two options. So as a centre forward, what do I do? Do I control it, flick it on, or lay it off? So I laid it off. I wasn't passing to, to Ginge, John Arnery, because he ain't as good as Stevie G. So I've laid it off to Stevie, and what a goal. It was just an unbelievable goal. And, and the moment, the noise inside Anfield when it went in was just unreal. It, it really was a special night, that one. You, you speak about the atmosphere, obviously, at the Arsenal game, but... I'm sure, I'm sure you wanted to stay there just, just yeah. as much after Olympiacos that. was the loudest I experienced Anfield as a player Chelsea in the semis was the loudest I experienced because I was injured in the old main stand it was just unbelievable noise when we beat Chelsea in, in the semis that year 
But that's what football to me was about. Experiencing moments and memories that I'll, I'll never forget. When Stevie scored that goal against Olympia, I, c- I can still feel the buzz now thinking what we went on to achieve, but it was just amazing to be on the pitch and experience that at the time. Obviously then, Liverpool, as we all know, went on the cup run in the Champions League to go and make it five times under Rafa Benitez. You were obviously injured during yeah. that. How frustrating was that, obviously being injured and not being part of the Istanbul final? Yeah, yeah. well I knew I, I couldn't walk, so I needed my operations to be done, both knees. Um, but I supported the boys all the way through. We were underdogs all the way through, Leverkusen, Juventus, Chelsea, everyone said no chance, final, AC Milan, we've got no chance, 3-0 down at half time, we've got no chance, you're thinking oh my god, uh, we've done all the hard work and then what happened in the final, but I was there, you know, Rafa wanted me to be there, so I was grateful for that, so when Stevie lifts the trophy, um, I, I was on the podium, as the confetti is going everywhere, and what a moment that was to see the captain lift the trophy and all the Liverpool fans around the stadium was was quite unique. So I got to share the moment with my teammates, my mates, um, probably the greatest ever Champions League final there has been and probably will be. What a comeback that was. There's obviously, for, the, for our viewers listening, there's a bit about Morientes getting down. Fernando. So Fernando was, was cup tied. I think he'd been at Real Madrid that season yeah. and, and he'd won it like three times. <laughs> and so there was 10 players, including myself, that were, were cup tied or injured that were trying to get down onto the pitch. But there were 69,000 fans, the official attendance that day. 60 must have been Liverpool. There was only about 9,000. Honestly, there wasn't many AC that night. All Liverpool, all around the stadium. And the problem was, we were all in our Liverpool trackies because we were part of the official uh, team following thing. And loads of Liverpool fans, about 50-odd thousand, were in the Liverpool trackies trying to get on the pitch at the end of the game. So we're trying to get on the pitch and this steward's just not having it at all because he doesn't know who I am, doesn't know who Kirk is. So then Morientes goes, well, I'm Fernando Morientes. And the guy doesn't speak much English, but you've heard of the name Morientes because yeah. he's a great name in football. And he's sort of starting to buy it and he's not sure. So Morientes got his passport out and went, bang, Morientes won Champions League three times. Uh, so then the steward started hugging him, saying, you can come on, no problem. But Morientes made sure that the rest of us, the other eight, nine, or however many it was, got on the pitch as well, because the steward was no way going to let us on the pitch. So he let us on, and we got to the podium just in time for the for the trophy lift. So that was a, a great moment. So I've got Fernando Morientes to thank for that one. And then there's obviously another story about a runner-up medal. There's two eight yeah. medals left. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we're on the podium. Everyone's done these celebrations with the trophy. And then as the players walked off, uh, remember the centre-half, Pellegrini, I think his name was? He was on loan from Malaga, he'd cup tied as well. I think he went on to manage Southampton. Anyway, he got sacked at Southampton. But he was like wandering about the podium and, and saw medals. And he said to me, do you want one of these medals? So the players were walking off with the trophy. I was like, yeah, I'll have one of them. Thinking that it was a gold medal. It's like, yeah, no problem. Looked at it, it's a, it's a silver, runners up medal, losers medal, whatever you want to call it. So I said, I still have that, no problem. So I put it in my pocket. Tried to change it with Traore and the I've not, I've not. Um, so yeah, so I gave it my mum and dad to keep and, and that's so I'm still waiting for Maldini or Shevchenko to, to get in touch to get it back. They beat us two years later, so they ended up getting a winner's medal themselves. But yeah, there was no winners left, it was just a runners up when I got. And then the next day, um the parade and unfortunately you missed out of that parade. Do you want to explain a bit of what happened there? Probably the most heartbreaking thing I've experienced in football. It was it was tough. So we flew back. The 18, I think the, the Champions League squad final was, had a different flight to everybody else on the club. So the 18 and their girlfriends, wives, and the press all flew. And now we're after Istanbul the next day. So we stayed the night after we, we won, celebrated till whatever time. Can't remember what happened, to be honest. <laughs> So we flew back to Liverpool. They landed an hour after us, but the problem was Liverpool airport was chocker with Liverpool fans arriving back from Istanbul. So getting your bags was carnage. So the first team got to Melwood while we were still at the airport, even though we'd landed an hour before. And Stevie and and Rafa were like, we'll wait for you, we'll wait for you. And then the police were like, there's a million people on the streets of Liverpool. You have got to go now. Otherwise we're gonna have some kind of an accident. So so we have got to go. and so they went, and I get it, because it was safety reasons, it was nothing to do with us. So when we arrived at Melwood, half an hour after they'd left, they'd gone. So I was sat in the in the change room, like devastated, like just as if I'd just lost the Champions League final. I was like, oh my God. So I drove home, crying, turned the telly on, 
and watched my mates with all the fans. I had family all, all around the city. So you'd been with the night before. I, I, so. I had friends all dotted about the route around Liverpool waiting to see me and wave. And um, yeah, devastated. I was, I was crying my eyes out watching that at home. That is a, a horrible, horrible memory. I can't believe you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, that was not nice. And then you joined Wigan on loan then. Yeah. Um, so do you want to explain what is it like to, to go on a loan as a footballer? Do, is it new house, rents, hotels? Because you don't know how it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, at West Ham, because that was down south, I was in a hotel for two months on my own, just eating hotel food. So that's not good for me at all. Then I got an apartment for four months with another lad. And all we had in the fridge was bottles of Cronenberg because we were just young pros. We didn't know how to cook or anything, so that was just carnage. When I went to Wigan, I was still living with my mum and dad, so it was I could commute, and I had a car by then, so it was, it was fine. Um, but the longer distance ones are the really tough ones for the young players. They need that help, how to look after yourselves. I think modern day players do. I didn't know how to cook, so that was a big problem for me. But Wigan was down the road, it was fine. I turned up on my first day at Wigan, Paul Jewell was the manager. I've got a tight hammy. I mean, what? What? How can you say you got a tight hammy on your first day? So right, go in the gym, have a little fitness test because you're playing tomorrow against Middlesbrough. I was like, okay, fine. So I've done my fitness test, played the next day, scored the winning goal the next day for Wigan against Middlesbrough. But then, because I'd, I'd had 11 months out with injury, I played five games in two weeks at the highest level, and my body couldn't take it. It then shut down for another six months because of the, 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 knee, the knee problems I had. Yeah, Liverpool careers obviously then come to an end how, yeah. how did that come to an end it, it's very different to how people would imagine it's a case of the chief scout coming up to me and going Rafa doesn't want you anymore what club do you want to sign for and I'm stood there in a dressing gown coming out of the swimming pool going I'm injured so my head's up my ass anyway and you're telling me the, the manager doesn't want me and that was how it was so I was like um, okay right fine so I had to find a new club so it wasn't Rafa saying thanks for everything Football's ruthless. That's the way it is. I don't hold. Not speak to you at all no, I, I don't hold anything about against the man. It's ruthless. I was no good to him. I was injured, and he was like, "Right, go and find a new club." And he got somebody else to say that. But that, that's how football works. There is not many football clubs in England that go, "Thank you very much, all the best." It just doesn't happen. You've then obviously you found Preston North End. Who you obviously went to play over a hundred games for. Yeah, good club. In the end. Um, how was your time at Preston? Enjoyed it, yeah, really enjoyed it. Um, it was a club not too far away, knocking on the door to get in the, in, the, in the Premier League. Completely different to Liverpool. I've gone from one of the biggest clubs in the world to a club that isn't as big, but more of a community, more of a, a family club. But I, I really enjoyed my time there. Got some good memories, some good moments. Learned about Preston. So I was saying about Steve Highway, commit yourself to the club. So Preston don't like Burnley, they don't like Blackpool. So I got to learn, I can't like those football clubs while I was at Preston. And I scored against those clubs. So so the fa so the, for the fans, it was good memories as well. I think I was there six or seven years. Again, it was injury hit. I had to manage injuries throughout that. But it was nice to experience um, some good times at, at Preston. And then you signed for Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, at that point, we you sort of knowing, obviously because of all your injuries, that your career was coming to sort of the end? I was 28. I was, I was, I was thinking I'm OK, yeah. Now, um, I was ready to kick on, yeah. I, I thought I could kick on back to the Premier League, but I knew I was managing my knees. Um, but I was flying at Wednesday. I got 20 goals and I missed 10 games because the manager dropped me for giving a penalty away. It was like, what, madness, Gary Megson. And um, now I was ready to kick on. I, I saw a psychologist for the first time in my life about how I need to get out of League One, back to the Premier League. I was sat on the bench at Yeovil and I looked round and thinking, I do not want to be sat on a bench at Yeovil. It's just where I've been in the Champions League at Liverpool Premier League. So that was a bit of a, a realisation. And after that moment, I did kick on and started scoring quite a few goals and I was close to getting a move but injuries again came in unfortunately Obviously your decision about retirement at such a young age wouldn't, it, wouldn't have been an easy one how, how long did that process take you to obviously decide to retire and then obviously to, to get over the early retirement Yeah I don't think any player ever gets over it you know it, I, I lived the dream of being a professional football player would have wanted more experiences um, it was medical advice I didn't have any decision a surgeon said to me, you cannot play anymore because your body's a wreck. So I was like, okay, 
loads of tears of course um, but then I had to look at what I'd, I'd had the memories that I've wanted wanted more but I had to focus on what was next um, it's never nice when it comes to an end but it's nice to have had a little bit of something a couple of memories and so um, yeah I chose not to dwell on, on not being able to play anymore and focus on what I could do and then obviously as you say moving on after life after football uh, your broadcasting career now so you're at Sky Sports uh, you're also on LFC TV yeah um, what's that like as a former professional footballer to now see the game from a different angle I think for me I've always believed football's about opinion when people say play football the right way I don't agree with that you can have an opinion on football you can I can that's the way football should be because we all love the game so for me um when I'm broad, when I'm being a broadcaster, a pundit, a commentator, a reporter, or whatever it may be, it's how I see the game. So if I describe a goal, say a great goal from Stephen, you might describe it differently because that's how you see football differently. Um, but I love football, Premier League, Champions League, League One, League Two. I love it all. Even even the non-league football, even Vauxhall non-league. I love all aspects of English football. Not a big fan of Serie A, La Liga, all that sort of stuff. Not a big fan of that. English football. I absolutely love so to get to games at Barrow v Colchester that's fine for me on a Tuesday nil nil that's absolutely fine I just love being there and seeing what it means to the local fans um, so that I still get a buzz from that Was obviously broadcasting going on TV something that was in the back of your mind when you knew you was coming to an end or yeah not really TV yeah not TV I wanted to go down the media route but I didn't know where whether it was TV radio written press so I did it so the degree and I loved it so when I was at Preston I was writing in the programme I was doing the local radio to, to see if I, I liked it and then when I came out more opportunities came to eventually being on the uh, on, on the telly which is quite nerve wracking when somebody says to you in your ear right you've got five seconds to tell me what's happened and you're thinking what's happened I've got no replay who crossed it did he edit did he volley it was it his left foot his right foot Should the, so all of a sudden these things are going on in your head that's, that's quite hard yeah <laughs> Right, so Neil, that's it. We've been through your Dumb. career as a Dumb. right, okay. So thank you very much for tuning in. Um, obviously like and subscribe and we'll be back next week with another episode. Um, thank you very much to the Bedford Lukes for sponsoring this podcast. Uh, thanks Neil. Bedford Lukes. The Bedford Lukes. Love it. Cheers.